Uh, we resume now with leaders' questions, and I call on Deputy Michal Matt. Very much indeed, Corla. Um, Tarnished uh, the ongoing saga in relation to the selection of primary care centres, uh, particularly in North Dublin, uh, goes on unabated. And the more uh, that the Minister Riley endeavours to explain himself, the more questions required to be answered. Now, when you stand back from the whole situation, what emerges really that it is a Labour minister who has had to resign and the public outsider baffled by the fact that a minister who was pursuing the implementation of part of the programme for government um, in an open and transparent way found it necessary to resign. People do not understand that. And also the sense of abandonment, the sense that that minister was isolated by you, Tonishta, and by her senior Labour Party colleagues. That is the general sense out there. Uh, and I would want to put it to you, Tisha, or Tarnishta, that the answers have kept on changing along the way. From the very beginning, we get different answers all of the time, and that continued right up to yesterday, uh, and uh, in, in terms of site selection itself. Uh, wrongly, uh, and, and Minister Quinn, I believe, was incensed by having to take the fall or being given back wrong information, but M M Minister Harney was blamed wrongly yesterday for selecting the site. Uh, can you answer us today, to when was the site selected? And just give a definitive answer on that. Uh, and also, if you would agree, in order to put an end to this, to publish all documentation, all advices relating to this issue. Because on the 16th of May, the Minister in the parliamentary reply here, more or less in the parliamentary reply, it represents a complete adherence to the system that Minister Shortall had outlined. There was no hint of anything different happening, no hint of anything being added. Yet in June, we read in the Fingal um, Independent that he was signalling to people publicly that uh, Bad Brigham was going to be added. Uh, and, so, and then in July, he unilaterally uh, um, over, if it overrides the uh, decisions of his Minister for State. So will you agree to publish all documentation, all advices? Because the Secretary General of the Department of Health, Amaros McLaughlin, has said that he cannot confirm whether he saw the final list or not. And it's noticeable in more recent replies, particularly the ministers of last Thursday, Thank you. that he says, I personally added the criteria was my criteria or decided by me. You get a sense of the civil service demarcation being very clearly in evidence here as removed from what happened subsequent uh, to Minister Shortall's list. Uh, and that's a very important issue. And I think the one way we could sort this out is if all the advices and all uh, the documentation um, was published. And can you finally confirm, what, were you consulted personally by Minister Riley in relation to the added sites? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, Minister Riley did uh, reply to these issues in the House yesterday. And of course, if there are any further questions that um, uh, Deputy Martin or any other deputy wants to put to him, I'm sure he's very happy to um, give, replies, uh, give replies to it. Um, with regard to documentation, uh, documentation is available in any event uh, publicly under the Freedom of Information uh, uh, system. Uh, I don't have any difficulty with the making available of, uh, of documentation. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I did see uh, newspaper reports uh, this morning uh, and I met earlier today with Minister Riley, uh, with the Secretary General of the Department of Health, with the new CEO of the uh, HSE, and uh, they have told me directly that there was no ministerial involvement of any kind in the selection of any individual site for a primary, uh, for a primary care centre. Uh, with regard to the issue of consultation with me, uh, remember that this was in the context of uh, the production of a stimulus package uh, for our economy, two and a quarter billion, which was announced by, uh, by Brendan Howland. There was a decision taken to increase the number from 20 to, uh, to 35. Uh, I was consulted about that. I did agree to that. Uh, I agreed with the rationale uh, for that. And my primary uh, concern was that we had a good um, stimulus package uh, and that um, uh, it uh, maximized the amount of uh, input that there would be uh, to the economy, uh, to the uh, creation of, uh, of jobs. And uh, I agreed with the uh, increase from 20 to 35. Uh, I find that an extraordinary response. And just very quickly, Tony, don't tell me I have to depend on freedom of information. I'm asking you as Deputy Leader of the Government to see to it 
that all the documentation right now, in the next couple of days, is published. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. I don't want Secretary General saying that their correspondence with the Minister is confidential. On this issue, transparency demands that all the documentation be published now. Not to be waiting for two or three months for this storm to abate and then the documentation is fed out and our sum is redacted as all of our previous experiences with FOI requests the government have, have, have shown. It's been redacted. So I really want the documentation published. And no one ever said any minister was involved in selection of, excite, of a site except yourself. So you said that, or, not, or your, 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 your Rory Quinn. We're talking about, we're talking about the adding on of centres, Tarnishta. And what I want to say, Tarnishta, again, the answer, the stimulus package. That's a very, very feeble response. Because Minister Shortall was anxious that those uh, in most need would get the allocation. Hence the list. Dundalk was 21st on the list. Swords was 144th. Do you stand over that? You could have had another 15 that were on Roshan Shortall's list, beyond the 20, on the basis of an internationally recognised index you, of Deputy. deprivation. And that would have satisfied any stimulus needs. But this was never a stimulus project. This was a project to develop primary care in accordance with the programme for government. That's what the project was. Thank you. And an internationally agreed criteria was drawn up between the HSE, the Department of Health, and Minister Shortall, who was given responsibility for primary care. And you abandoned her. And you consulted with Minister Riley and said, Thank OK, you. we'll divvy this up for whatever reasons, political expediency or, or reasons in the constituency, you can't admit it. And be honest and say why Thank you. the list was added to in a very arbitrary way and a very unilateral way, completely at variance with the nine-month-long uh, degree of work that Minister Shortall, her officials and the HSE put into it. It's a very okay. weak response to, to try and cover this up in the, under the cloak of the stimulus package. Deputy Martin, you're in no, pos you're in no position. <coughs> you're in no position of all of the issues, of all of the issues that you can that you can choose to raise here. Health, you are in no position. You are in no position. You are in no position. I will answer the question. I did answer you. I did answer you. I did answer your. I did answer your question. I mean, you're the. I mean, you're the. You're the architect. You're the architect of the HSE. You were in government. You were in government at a time when there was money in this country, and you allowed the health system to deteriorate. You kept throwing money at it, and then you ended up you ended up creating creating the HSE. And what we're doing, 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 is reforming our re reforming our health system. In times, in times when there's less money, when there's... Do, do you want the answer? I mean, you keep, you keep bellyaching. You keep, you keep bellyaching about, about the not giving an answer. Every time I try to answer, you keep interrupting. What you're doing, what you're doing is, is, I mean, you're the man, you're the man that said there should be an end to politics as usual. You're continuing politics as usual. And what we're doing is we are reforming the health service in times when money is uh, less available and when we have less staff. And our priority here is to shift to primary care in our health system. In order to shift to primary care in our health system, it's not just a matter of writing it down in a programme for government or writing it down in a document. You have to provide... Will you please listen, Will you please listen to the answer? In order, in order to deliver the reforms in order to deliver the reforms in the primary in the primary in order to deliver the reforms in the primary care system we have to provide the resources and that's what we were doing in the stimulus package and that is why the primary care centers were included uh, in that in that stimulus package and the real story here the real story here deputy martin is that whereas you presided over the decline of our health service this government is making is making, this government is making reforms this government is making reforms and driving ahead and driving ahead with the provision of primary, of primary care, of primary care systems. And when I cut to the chase and give you, and you accuse me of saying when you, uh, you never accused uh, Minister Riley of this or you didn't, you, you know, I cut to the, I'm cutting to the chase on this and I'm telling you, I asked the questions of the Secretary General of the Department of Health and the uh, CEO of the HSE and I've told you, I've told you the answer that, that, that they have both given me, which was that there was no ministerial involvement in the selection of individual sites. I called Deputy Martin.
Deputy Minister, I call Deputy MacDonald, please. Thank you. Deputy MacDonald, thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen Corla. Uh, Tanish, so welcome back. You were missed. It was busy. Uh, <laughs> Tanish, sta yesterday's statement. Yesterday's statement by Ken Carter. If you wouldn't mind, know, the yes, little I boy know, heckling it, you know, might cease. Sorry, would you please proceed? Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Could you please proceed without interruption? Thank you. Yesterday's statement by Minister James Riley in relation to the primary care centre con controversy has answered none of the key questions. What has emerged and what we do know is that the Balbriggan site belonged to a Fine Gael supporter or advocate and was selected on Minister Riley's watch, not under the, the previous government as had been suggested. Now, Minister Riley, and indeed the Taoiseach, had told the Dáil consistently that there had been consultation with senior Labour cabinet ministers in respect of the change to criteria and the additional primary health care centres. Joan Burton, Brendan Howland, all denied that they had been consulted. So at least today, Tánish, that we now know where that senior level consultation happened, because James Riley came and spoke to you about it, or so you have told us. Can I ask you, Tanishta, when you first became aware of concerns over Minister Riley's decision to locate two of the additional primary health care centres in his own constituency, when did you uh, become aware of that? Did former Minister Shortall bring her concerns to you before her resignation? Were you aware of those concerns when you signed off on the additional 15 healthcare centres? Were you aware of those concerns at the time that you voted confidence in Minister Riley? Now, you've made a, a speech there Thank about you. openness and reform all of which you are manifest, manifestly failing to deliver. I can't understand why, despite unease even within your own political party and with two MEPs calling uh, for Minister Riley to do Thank the you, decent Ms. thing Thank and you, step Deputy. down, why, why you still stand by him. Let me give you, just quote the Minister no, from Mike Ken Corla from, from, from yesterday, and how's this for transparency and, and clarity? He said one and one makes two, and two and two makes four, but four by four makes 16, and not four and four, which makes eight. And so it is with this. It is a logistical, logarithmic progression. Thank you. Now, is he for real, Tanish, then? Thank you. That is he good. as clear as mud? Thank you. The criteria were fixed, and well, you know it. There was stroke politics at Sorry. the heart of government, and well, you know it. Answer chair. my Thank questions, you. and let's see if you'll actually stand by your promises for reform. Uh, Ken Corley, there is no secret whatever uh, about the fact that there were differences between former Minister Shortall and Minister Riley. And at all times, uh, I supported uh, Minister Shortall in what she was uh, seeking to do in the Department of Health. Um, there were uh, a variety of uh, uh, meetings that were held, uh, including uh, a meeting between the Taoiseach, myself, uh, Minister Riley, uh, and Minister Shortall uh, prior to the summer. Uh, we put in place a working group representative of the uh, office of the Taoiseach and my own office uh, to address some of these uh, issues and to um, uh, make progress on them, and, and that working group uh, has been making progress since then. My priority, and the priority of this government, and remember, we're dealing with this in times of very serious financial difficulty in the country, my priority is to achieve a reform in our health system. That reform is, at the centre of that reform, is the shift to primary care. And there's a very good reason uh, why we want to shift to primary care, and that is that because people out there who want to access our health system have to go to the GP, then they have to go somewhere else to get the blood test, somewhere else to get, uh, to, to get another... To, to, to get another... 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Deputy. I'm sorry, Deputy MacDonald. It is not waffle to the parent of a sick child who has to go from Billy to Jack under our under our under our health un, under our health system. And our priority, our priority as a government, is to get primary care centres provided and built and staffed and up and running. And that is why. That is why. In the, in the, that is why in the stimulus package that we produced, and you party, your party, Sinn Féin was one of the people getting up here constantly, day in, day out, where is the stimulus package, why isn't there a stimulus package? We've produced a stimulus package. It's two and a quarter million, million euros, and we have taken the opportunity in that stimulus package of including the provision of primary care centres so that we can provide in local communities a centre where somebody who's out there who's ill or who has a sick child can go and get the range of services provided under one roof rather than the ragged, disorganised, inefficient and costly system that we have at the moment. That's what we're doing. That's what the programme for government says that we're going to do and that is what we are going to press, press ahead and, and to do. No, I was not. The issue of the criteria and so on was I involved in the I was no more involved in the criteria for how primary care centres were selected in the Department of Health than I was involved in the criteria that were used in the Department of Education for the selection of schools or the criteria that were used in the Department of Transport for the selection for the selection of roads. What I was involved in and what I'm proud to have been involved in is that we produced a package, a financial package, despite all of the financial difficulties that this country has, which provided for the building and staffing and resourcing and pressing ahead of primary, primary care centres. And I've recently appointed Deputy Alex White to take charge of that, and I am confident that he will deliver on that as part of the team in the Department of Health. Uh, thank you, sir. Sorry, well, Tarnish, one minute. Thank Tarnish, you. Tarnish, so you're well aware that you don't have to convince anyone in this House as to the value and necessity of primary health care centres, so I do wish that you would dispense with what amounts to waffle when straight questions are put to you. So let's piece it together now, because you're not volunteering information, it has to be extracted from you. So you did, you, d you did sign off. You did sign off. Sorry, there's a time limit on this. You, you did me. sign off on the additional 15 uh, primary health care centres. When you did that, you were aware of Roisin Shortall's concerns. You tell us that you didn't know anything about the criteria. Can I suggest to you, as Tanishta, that you should have paid more attention? And if you didn't know about the criteria then, I hope to God you're going to get to your feet and tell us that you have an understanding of the criteria now. Because I have to tell you, Tanish, that none of the rest of us can make head nor tail of Thank the you. incoherent bluster coming from Minister Riley. You see, you. there was a predetermined outcome to this, and the criteria were fixed to achieve that. I think you know that, and I think... That is the reason for your reluctance to spell out clearly and to answer clearly specific questions put to you. You signed off on the additional health centres. You did so knowing the difficulties and deep concerns that uh, Roisin Shortall had. You voted confidence in a minister who, quite frankly, I can't see you could have had any Thank confidence you. You. in. You. you hung Roisin Shortall out to dry and you make no apology for it. And now, and to top it all, Tanishtha, you won't even give a basic commitment, if you don't understand the criteria, to publish all of the documentation for public scrutiny so that the rest of us have the benefit you, of Deputy. that information. Reform my eye. Thank you. Tanishtha. <laughs> the criteria. I don't see you making any complaint about the selection of the uh, additional primary care centre in Deputy Adams' constituency. There's no complaint, to, no complaint about that. I didn't hear any complaint from you. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, that's one of the 15. That's one of the 15. I didn't hear any complaint from you uh, when we uh, decided to, to fund or any complaint about what criteria were used 
uh, to decide on the selection of Grange Gorman as a place where, in your constituency, uh, which is, which is uh, a place, and we're proud to do it, to develop a third level, a new third level uh, uh, education, uh, education facility uh, in, uh, in, 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 that, in, in that constituency. The key issue here, the key issue here, the key issue, the key, the key, the key issue here, the key issue here is that this government is pressing ahead with the reform of the health service, with the provision of primary care centres, which is what matters to the people out there and the people who want to see a better health care system. And we are providing the funding for that, and that was done uh, in, the, uh, in the stimulus package. And with regard to uh, all of the allegations and implications and so on, that somehow there was uh, political uh, interference in it, as I've said, I met today with Minister Riley, Secretary General of his department, uh, the new CEO of the HSE, and they told me directly uh, that there was no in ministerial involvement in the selection of any individual site. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Jane Ross, thank you. Deputy Jane Ross, thank you. Thank you, Kankola. Maybe I could be allowed to make the Doyle a Riley free zone for the next few minutes, to the relief maybe of some members of the government. That, that issue has tended, I think, to overshadow an equally important issue which happened three days ago and one day ago. Three days ago, the AIB bondholders were paid one billion. One day ago, AIB mortgage holders were charged another half percent on their mortgage if they have a standard variable rate. Those who are affected by this, those mortgage holders, the borrowers, do not miss the connection and they see their money and the extra payments they're making as a direct payment going to the bondholders. Thomas, you will be aware, because it's been well publicized, that those with a not unusual mortgage now of up to of 300,000 will be paying an extra 1,000 euro, 1,080 euros per annum as a result of this half percent rise. Donister, I don't know if you realize how many of these people simply won't be able to pay that particular half percent rise. How many of these people you're going to be asking to pay more money and more taxes on the same properties in the budget that's coming up? We're now reaching a situation where Middle Ireland simply cannot pay what the government is asking it to pay. And please don't come back to me and say this is not a government matter. Because I agree with you if you say that, because the banks have been allowed, particularly AIB, to go walk about. There's a kind of declaration of independence by AIB at the moment, where it's taking its own decisions, it's crucifying its mortgages, and the, and the government which after all owns nearly 100% of AIP, which has two independent, supposedly independent uh, public interest directors, is, putting its, is, 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 is washing its hands of a huge problem where, where it has a serious control. And the question is this. Is it government policy that it contributes and helps the crippling mortgage debt which we are now facing, and this rising problem, by allowing this bank, which they fully own, to add to the debt by putting up mortgages for those who can't afford it. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, it, the issue of um, mortgages, mortgage arrears, the difficulties that people have in meeting their mortgage commitments uh, is very much uh, top priority for, uh, for the government. And that is why, as you know, Deputy Ross, we have brought forward the personal insolvency legislation. It's due to come back into the House at uh, report stage uh, shortly. Um, it is why we have uh, put in place uh, a range of measures uh, to support people who are in mortgage difficulty uh, and uh, to ensure uh, that people don't lose their home uh, in, this, uh, in, in this financial crisis. In relation to the banks, uh, this government, unlike its predecessor, has had a regular engagement uh, with the banks about a range of issues, uh, their obligation to uh, lend to, to business, uh, what they are doing about new mortgages, 
uh, and what they are doing uh, to deal with the problem of, uh, of mortgage arrears. On a wider um, uh, scale, it is why this government has put, uh, we inherited, uh, as you know, the um, banking crisis and uh, the decisions that have been made by, by a previous government, and it is why uh, we have worked uh, to secure agreement at European Union level on the separation of bank debt from, from sovereign debt. It is why uh, we are insisting uh, that that agreement is implemented uh, in full and that the huge burden that has been placed on the back uh, of Irish taxpayers as a result of the banking collapse, uh, that that burden uh, is, uh, is lifted. I think in terms of commercial decisions made by uh, AIB, I think you would be the first uh, to uh, criticise the government if it sought to uh, do the, a kind of hands-on decision-making in the banks in relation to, uh, to, commercial, uh, to commercial decisions. Uh, but as far as uh, the government is concerned and as far as mortgage holders uh, are concerned, this government is firmly on the side of mortgage holders, people who are having difficulty meeting their mortgage uh, payments, and that is why we are taking the steps that we have taken and will continue to do so. Thank you. Deputy Ross? Thank you, John, for your reply. Um, I'd just like to correct you. I'd be the first to say that you guys should be intervening, and you should be intervening on a day-to-day -day basis on decisions of this sort. You own it. You've got two directors there. I don't know what they're there for. If they're not there, to have an input into policy de decisions. AIB has a disgraceful record as regards its mortgages, as regards its country, and brought its countries to its knees. And this, those people who were there then are still there now. Appointments are still being made to the board of the old cronies, the old people are resurfacing and, and, resurfacing and being appointed to the board. And what you should be doing, you should be ringing up the bank and saying, it is not government policy, we do not want a half percent increase in mortgages for these people, and we forbid you to do it. That's where you should be, because this half percent is obviously now part of government policy. It's rather like a tax, Tronstad, because you're asking those people who are being charged that half percent to actually support a state asset which is losing money. It's equivalent to a tax. And I suggest, no, Tornister, you should be intervening. You should be saying no more interest rate rises at this stage and giving instructions to those directors who, I don't know what they do, those directors who are there at your whim and, uh, and at your beck and call. Thank you. But, and the final question is this. I don't know the answer to it, and that's why I'm asking you this. What proportion of this money which AIB is taking in mortgages, and particularly in the increase, is actually going to AIB? Is the Tornish to aware that a large number of these mortgages, and I don't know the percentage, have been sold off and securitized and sold off in bundles to other institutions which are abroad, which are outside the jurisdiction of this country, so a lot of this money isn't even going to AIB or the government or any, anybody else. It's actually going outside the country because these, these, these mortgages have been securitized. Could the, could the Tornish, I don't expect him to give me an answer now specifically to that, but could he tell me, is he aware of that and is he aware of such a large, what proportion of these are actually not even going to AIB itself? Thank you. Tornish. Uh, Deputy Ross, uh, I don't propose to take um, uh, advice from you in relation to um, how the banks should be run, because I recall uh, the advice that you gave the previous government when you told them that they should make Sean Fitzpatrick the governor of the Bank of Ireland. Um, so you know you don't have you don't have a particularly you don't have a particularly good track record uh, track record on this. Neither am I going to uh, come in here and defend the practices uh, of banks uh, now or uh, in the past. What this government is doing in relation to our banking system is to, work, is to ensure, first of all, that we have a banking system uh, that is fit for purpose for our economy. It is work in progress, and there are a number of dimensions to it, one of which is uh, resolving the issue of the separation of the debts associated with banks and the state, uh, which uh, is work that uh, is a priority for the, uh, for the government at the moment. Secondly, to ensure that our banks serve our economy and serve the people of this country. And that's why we have a continuing discussion and dialogue with the banks about that on a regular basis. Uh, and thirdly, uh, to ensure that people uh, who um, 
uh, are mortgage holders and are paying their, their mortgage, uh, that their homes are not put at risk. And that is why we have putting in place the personal insolvency legislation, uh, the support and advice system uh, that, we have, uh, that we have put in place, and a range of housing supports uh, which are being done uh, through the uh, Department of Environment uh, and Local Government. The interest of mortgage holders and their needs is very much uh, at, the uh, at the front of the whole approach that the government is taking uh, to, dealing, uh, to dealing with our banks. It is, uh, as I said, a work in progress. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it, is, it is difficult, it is difficult work, uh, but it is work that we will succeed in. Thank you. That completes Leader's question.